everything everyone a certain doctor professor said that man is the author of his own morality we decide what is right and what is wrong morals are determined by culture and other factors but not specifically not by god and this theory is widely accepted in universities all over it is something that is taught as fact in fact that mit and others they have a course called evolutionary psychology evolutionary psychology and this is the study of human behavior as it relates to, uh, relates to evolution forget god they say they want to explain human behavior in light of evolution the reason why we do what we do why we say what we say how we act how we treat one another is all the process or product of evolution and so forget god there's another reason why we distinguish between right and wrong steven pinker in the new york times way back in 1997 argued that a woman who kills their newborn baby sh should not be treated in the same manner as those who kill their older children or adults. They might not be mad, he avers, but simply unconsciously doing what is best for the tribe. So what he's saying is when they're acting in this fashion, it is just evolution taking its part. It's just evolution playing out. And the, the decision that this lady made or the, that these ladies would make is not necessarily wrong. It is just part of the evolutionary process. Is man just so sugary sweet that we came up with the idea of right and wrong? That we came up with the system of morality. Have we evolved into beings that are morally right? Did the ape say one day to the other ape, let's start talking about what is right and wrong. Let's start talking to ourselves about what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. What we ought not to do to one another, how we ought to treat one another. Is it in man to direct his own steps? Well, let's just consider what history says. Let's go to the Bible. And let's see how man has reacted over the times. First of all, let's turn to Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. We know the account. It is the account of the first murder that took place on earth. And we have Adam and Eve who have conceived uh, sons, Cain and Abel. And notice what man does in his own environment. And when he decides he wants to do whatever he wants to do, the Bible says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and she bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. But you should rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And so what we have here is man in his element, really, when you consider it. When the Lord refused his offering because it was not what it should be, the first reaction of Cain was to become furious. Now imagine this, if you will. You bring something as a praise offering to the Lord God of heaven. And the Lord God of heaven, who demands what type of offering he will accept, says this is not acceptable. And you get upset. Well, why won't you accept my unacceptable sacrifice? But this is what happened with Cain now being angry is a natural thing we understand we get angry at times for righteousness sake even but how do we deal with it do we allow it to consume us do we allow the sun to go down upon our wrath well here is man's actions without the guidance of god murder 
When he was upset, when he got angry, what he did is he murdered his brother. Now, we understand we've gotten upset before. We've gotten upset at other people, but we did not go through with that which is murder. We did not say, listen, I can't wait to be alone with this individual because I'm going to strike them down. Why not? Because we operate by a morality, by a principle that is set forth in the scriptures. It's not just because we think we're so good and we came up with that system. He acted upon his anger. He had no restraint. This man walking in his own way. But not only this, he also lied about it. So he is angry about his offering. He murders his brother and then he lies about it. When the Lord asked him where his brother is, he says, am I my brother's keeper? How am I supposed to know, Lord? How am I supposed to know where he is? It's not my business where he is and what he does. Do you gather the attitude here? There's an attitude of, I don't care about Abel. I'm not concerned about Abel. I'm not trying to be kind to him or to be interested in him. In fact, I don't know where he is. And even if I didn't have anything to do with his dead, I wouldn't care. That's man. That's man at his worst. This is the way of man when left to himself. If man continues on this trend, what would the world be like? If man continues on the trend of murdering, if man continues on the trend of justifying the things that they're doing as right when God indeed said it was wrong. If they say like Abel or like Cain, am I my brother's keeper? I'm going to do whatever I want to do. That's the way of man as we read very early on in the Bible. But you have to go a few pages over, just a few pages over if you will. Genesis chapter 6, we have another illustration of mankind. And what mankind is like when left to himself, when left to his own devices. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, the Bible says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth, and that every intent and thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Here we have a great example of the way of man and the way of the world. Every thought, the Bible says, was only evil continually. Was given to evil every single day. Every thought was only given to that which is unrighteous, to that which is ungodly. Every desire, every thought, every action was geared towards that which is destructive or evil. How long? Just on the weekends when they were partying? No, every single day. That is how man is when he is without God. This was not God's way. It was their way. They came up with it. It is not the case that God's way was not present. Because Genesis chapter 6 verses 8 through 9 says that God's way was indeed present. Notice what it says. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man and he was perfect in his generation and he walked with God. Noah was walking in God's way so we know God's way was present. But the rest of the world they were walking in their own way. They were doing what they wanted to do. They were wholly given to that which is unrighteous. We see the same thing today. There are channels, there are TV programs wholly given to that which is unrighteous. In fact, when you watch the history of television, and I've watched some of it, the history of television when shows or rather channels like HBO came out, and all of those type of channels, you know what the, what the idea behind those channels were? We want to provide programs that can be shown without restriction. They said, we want to provide programming that can be R-rated, that can be X-rated. We don't have to worry about the audience because at that time when it came out, it was taboo for them to put certain things on television in certain times. But then they said, no, we need to do more. And so that's why most of the programs that are on those channels are lewd. Most of the programs that are on those channels are immoral. Why? Because that's what they desire. They desire it every day. They desire it to be continually in it. That's their way. That's man's way to be engrossed in immorality. The world in Noah's day chose to walk in their own way. Their way was the way of wickedness and it led to their ultimate demise. We move on through the Old Testament and we consider another individual. Exodus chapter 1. Turn there with me if you will. Exodus chapter 1. We have Pharaoh who is over in the nation of Israel. He has enslaved them. Notice what the Bible says about Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 1 verses 8 through 16 it says now there arose up a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph and he said unto the people behold the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we 
Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. And in all their service, when they made them to serve, was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Sifra, and the name was Pua, and he said, when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew woman and you see upon the stools of it, see upon the stools of it, it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, you shall save her alive. So first of all, this is what man has done. Man has decided that, listen, they're getting a whole lot more than we are. What we need to do is we need to enslave them. We need to put them in bondage. When man is left to himself, he does not reason that every person is created equal before God. He reasons that he is better. He reasons his own interest. He needs to do something to protect himself at the expense of others. The king of Egypt had no qualms about putting the Jews into slavery. Where is his moral ethics? Where did he, why did he not say, listen, I ought not to do this? Did his moral ethics not evolve according to evolutionary psychology? We're supposed to evolve in our ethics. Did his not evolve at that time? They would say no. They were still figuring it out. They were still learning. Where is his moral ethics? But not only that, the king uh, thinks that this is the right thing to do. He doesn't think about whether this is, this is something that you know, we ought to do. He believes that this is the right thing to do to protect his nation. It is morally unrighteous. We understand it is wrong, but he believes it is the right thing to do. Many today would say it is wrong. Many today would say what Pharaoh did was wrong and it can never happen again. But why is it wrong? Have you ever asked yourself, why is it wrong what he did? Well, we would say, well, it, it is wrong because... Because we are created equal and we ought not to treat people that way. Why not? Why are we not to treat people that way? Can I treat people any way I want to? No, well, you can't. Why not? You keep asking that question. Why not? Why not? They don't have an answer. Because the only answer is God. The only answer is God said we ought not to do that. God said we ought to treat people better than that. God said we ought to be kind to individuals. We ought to not show partiality. That is the only law that dictates how we treat people. Mankind didn't come up with any law of how to treat people. In fact, contrary to that, was slavery not a problem in many countries? Were people who were of different color not discriminated against and treated with disdain? That's man's way. That's what they came up with. This is how we are going to treat people. Why is racism wrong? Why can we not hate one another? Why? What evolutionary scientific law would argue against racism? What scientific law would say, well, actually, you know what? Racism is wrong. Prejudice is wrong based upon this formula over here. You won't find one. There is no formula for it. Why? Because it comes from God's word. It comes from his principles. It's nothing that man thought up. But what about genocide? Pharaoh killed all the male children, murdered hundreds if not thousands of male infants. This is his way. That's man's way. It's not God's way. You know, Hitler did the same thing. This is what he did. He looked at over this nation and he said, you know what? We need to destroy these people. And so he murdered. He murdered and slaughtered thousands, millions, six million Jews, the number says. And why did he do this? Because he wanted to preserve a perfect race. What was wrong with that? What was wrong with the entire concept? If a man comes with his own moral standard, then according to Germany's standard, Hitler did nothing wrong. According to Germany's standard, Hitler was acting within his rights. After all, he evolved into that set of standards. He evolved into that way of life. And so why should anyone point a finger over here to what he's doing over there? But everybody understood that this was wrong. Everyone jumped in and said, listen, you can't do this. You can't act this way. Why not? Because we understood, because people understood that there was a higher moral code, even though they don't want to admit it. 
but we consider something as well in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 24 through 29. Just when you think you've seen the basis of man, just when you think that you've read it all, you go to 2 Kings chapter, uh, chapter 6, verses 24 through 29. When Syria is besieging, uh, Syria is besieging Samaria and Joram is the king, afterward Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and they besieged it, until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shackles of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five shackles of silver. They're eating these things because there's a famine in the land. But it gets worse. Now as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him, saying, Help me, my lord, O king. And he said, If the lord will not help you, how shall I help you? From the threshing floor or from the wine press? And, and the king answered her, What is your trouble? She answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. You read that right. This is an actual account. This is not some kind of uh, uh, anecdotal story or a metaphor, or an allegory. This is an actual account. And this is her lament. So we boiled my son and we ate him. And on the next day I said to her, Give your son that we may eat him. But she has hidden her son. And her complaint is not that we had just murdered her son or they have just murdered her son. That's not her complaint. Her complaint is that she's hiding her son and we can't eat him. That's man. That's what mankind does when left to himself. Man in his most desperate state. That's his way. It's not God's way. That's what man does. But what about today? We understand that there are many things happening today. Consider some of the things that have happened just over the last number of years. There was a video surfacing a while back of teens playing some sort of game of chicken running across the street. You might remember that. They were running across the street playing this game of chicken, running to the center and then coming back. And guess what happened to one of them? They got struck by a car. That was a great idea, wasn't it? No, but that's, that's their way. And so when this individual struck the teenager with the car, guess what happened to that individual? They beat him till he was in a coma. Why? Because he struck someone who ran out in front of him. That's man's way. Today, that is what man does. Three or four males standing by uh, watched a paraplegic drown. That was such a sad account. It's hard to just listen to the video or to the, to the audio because they had this, I believe it was last year. You hear them talking in the background. You hear them saying, oh, I think he's going to die. I think he's going to die and laughing about it. They couldn't prosecute them because they said they didn't do anything wrong. They didn't contribute to the man's death. The man was drowning. They just stood by and didn't do anything. That's mankind. That's what man operates or how he operates. Sandy Hook, Parkland, Las Vegas, the Twin Towers, as we will celebrate just this week. That's mankind and his way. College students, spring break party caused a riot, broke property and injured people and attacked police officers. This is while they were on spring break, drunk out of their mind. That's mankind. That's, that's his way. Dr. Gosnell ran an abortion clinic, killed seven newborns after being born alive, not to mention the millions of babies that are murdered in this nation on a yearly basis. That's mankind saying, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. This is man walking in his own way, doing what he pleases, and then some man has the nerve to say that we are the authors of our own morality. That the goodness that you see in the world, the kindness that you see in the world, comes from evolutionary process. That we're the ones who came up with it. That we thought about it, not when you read history. When you read history, you will find man being very cruel and very unkind. What will it take for folks to realize that it is not in man that walks to direct his own steps? How far will society have to fall before they recognize that being godless is futile? The problem with an evolutionary morality is this. If man makes up his own moral values, then there are no moral standards. If we make up our own moral values, then there is absolutely no standard whatsoever. Meaning that what is right for you may not be right for me. You have your moral standard and I have my moral standard. It would have to be. There is no other way. Unless all of us get together in some collective pool and say, okay, fine, let's decide what is right and wrong. I guarantee you there's going to be some disagreements. 
Because there are some who would say, well, you know, we believe that murdering a child in the womb is okay. There will be some that say, well, we actually believe that you can have the child, and if you don't like what you see, we will put it out of its misery. That's what we believe. And then there's those over here who say, listen, we don't believe that at all. How are you going to amalgamate all of those? How are we going to get together? How are we going to side on a universal morality? The problem arises because there are moral standards in the world. And, and people don't know how to deal with that. They don't know how to deal with the fact that there are standards of right and wrong. Everyone agrees murder is wrong. Every decent person agrees murder. You don't have to believe in God to believe murder is wrong. People go out and there may be an atheist and someone murders their, their wife, murders their child. What do they say? Well, I guess that was just, that was just them. It's just what they thought was right. No, they call the police. You need to do something. Why? Because we're a society, but what makes it wrong? You want the person to be punished. We look at things like, uh, things like rape and, and stealing and things of that nature. Every, if everyone comes up with their own moral standard, how is it that we can all believe in a common right and wrong relating to certain things? How can we believe in a common decency, a common kindness? Why do we feel guilty when we have done something wrong? Why do people continue to make excuses for why they're living a certain way? You know, if they say, well, listen, uh, my gender is this, and, and listen, I prefer to be with men. If I am a man, I prefer to be with women. If I am a woman, why are they constantly making excuses for it? Why not just live that way? You see, if everyone makes their own standard, why do you feel the need to justify it? Why do you feel the need to go on parades and let everybody else know, hey, this is who I am? If that is who you are, if that is where evolution has brought you, then go ahead and accept it. But deep down, you know there's something wrong with it. You know there's something wrong with it. That's why you continue to talk about it. That's why you continue to hold it in front of others and try to convince others that it is right. It is right. It is right. But then also ask yourself the question, what stops man from descending into complete chaos? What keeps people from murdering, plundering, and doing all sorts of violence to each other? Is it that we're just that good? Is it that we're just that good? That's what keeps the world at bay. We understand that government, as we talked about this morning, government are the enforcers of law and order. They protect people. They remove from society those who are a threat to society. We have laws that are there to protect us. Now, how do you suppose man came up with that concept? No, we understand God came up with that, not mankind. And so we understand that on the Supreme Court building, who does it have on the very top? I'm sure at some point they're going to want to remove him. Moses, right? The tablets. Right there on the Supreme Court building, they understand from where this system comes from, the system of law and order. It comes from God. It doesn't come from man. If you leave man to himself, he would say, listen, let's, let's get rid of everyone that we don't like and let's rule this thing. Our justice system is based on that which is found in the Bible. The laws we have are laws that God has set forth, not man. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1 says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. In verse 3 and 4, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear? If you would, you have no fear of the one who is in authority. Then do that which is good, and you will have re receive approval of the same. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. God is the author of law and order. The same law and order that keeps the world from descending into chaos. Have you ever seen countries where there, is no, where there are no rulers? Where government has fallen. You know what those countries look like? Look at Venezuela. Right? Just recently on the news. We see what that It's chaos everywhere. Why? Because the government is in turmoil. And so what happened to the people? They're doing whatever they want to do. So we understand the system of government. We understand that it was point, put in place by God. Not by man. But what about kindness? Goodwill towards another. Helping out our fellow man. There are a lot of good people in the world. A lot of good people in the world doing a lot of good things. This country is a very benevolent country. It's a very benevolent country. We, there's a lot of money that goes out to various people, various nations. In this country, you don't have to work and sit on your rear end and, and sit at home with your hand out, and they'll actually give you money. That's not necessarily benevolence. That's enabling. It's another story altogether. 
But we understand that there are people who do things like that. There are people who do uh, good deeds and, and charitable organization. How do you suppose that they got that way? Why is it that we're trying to be benevolent to other people? Certainly, we ought to be looking out for ourselves. Remember, survival of the fittest is the practice of Darwinian evolution. Survival of the fittest is the practice of an evolutionary theory. If you're not going to make it, if you don't have what it takes, it's too bad. I need to look out for myself for number one. In fact, this is exactly what Hitler tried to do. This is exactly what he based his entire concept of Darwinian evolution. That I'm trying to perfect a better race. I'm trying to do something better here. Why are they trying to stop him? Why are they trying to step in and say you cannot do this? Because we understand that there is good in the world. We understand that that good comes from a higher power. Romans 12 verses 9 and 10, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. Cling to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one toward another. Let brotherly love continue in honor, giving preference to one another. We understand that those are the type of things, the commandments that are in the scriptures that man follows even though he denies the scriptures. What about equality? What stopped slavery? What stopped it? Was it the fundamental concept that was uh, against the, uh, or, or what, what, what was the fundamental concept that was against the exploitation of others? What was the concept? Was it some scientific formula? No. Abraham Lincoln said four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. That's what he said. All men are created equal. Wait a second. No, we all evolved from apes, and so that concept cannot fly against slavery. That concept cannot certainly stand against slavery because we understand we were not all created equal. In our Declaration of Independence said, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You see, the things that ended those atrocities was the word of God. It was because they looked to it and they said, it is wrong. We can't do this. We can't continue like this. They understood that it was not within themselves. It was a higher power. It was God's word that led man to get rid of all sorts of atrocities. If it was good, if it was a benefit for mankind, it stems from the mind of God, not from the mind of of man to say that man came up with his own moral standards and to attribute the good in this world to man is a blatant lie and it's an insult to the sovereignty of God the way of man is himself even in our lives as Christians we are warned and cautioned about doing what seeking self because without God, we understand, we desire the way of the devil. And he says, oh, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. And that way will lead to destruction. C.S. Lewis, in closing, said the following in his book, Mere Christianity. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got to this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? People say, well, God is cruel. You know, God is cruel and he is all of these things. Well, if you're saying that about God, you're acknowledging first and foremost that there is a God. And if you're acknowledging first and foremost that there is a God, let's have a conversation about that God. Let's have a conversation about who he is. Let's try to understand him first and foremost before you start making accusations against him. It is the height of foolishness for an atheist to blame God for something when they don't even believe in God. They say, well, why did God do this? Well, that's not an argument. You don't believe in God. Why would you make that argument? And so it is the case. If man is the author of his own morals, how would I know what is right and wrong? Where would I have gotten the concept of right and wrong? Man would have followed his desires as we have seen in the scriptures and did that which he wanted to do without restraint, but he does not. What man has done, what we have done is sown self-control. 
We've shown goodness. We've shown kindness. Why? Because we've been taught so. Because God's word has taught us so. Whether the atheist will admit it or not, we have a standard to which we adhere, and that standard is God's. The way of man is not the way of God. The way of man in his own eyes, the Lord said, is not right. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. Now that may be something that we would tell our atheistic friends. It may be something that we would have discussions about with those who believe in the evolutionary theory or even evolutionary psychology. And we might use these arguments and say, well, look at what man has done, and you're telling me that, that we're just so good. We may use all of these arguments, but let's not forget to apply it at home first. Let's not forget to apply it to us. We need to make sure that we're not walking in our own ways, that we're not walking according to our own steps. We need to make sure that we understand that there is a God of heaven who has decreed how we should live. And he has decreed what is right and what is wrong. We don't get to make that decision. We live by what God has instructed. And so tonight, ask yourself the question, have you done that? Have you lived in accordance with what the Lord has decreed? Do you understand that you are walking by his ways because he is the one who is the supreme authority in all of our lives? If you have not, if you've been seeking self, if you've been doing your own thing, not looking at that which God has said, ask his forgiveness because he readily extends forgiveness. He readily extends it to the Christian who desires it because he desires all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The gospel plan of salvation is extended once again tonight. Why? Because God desires all men to be saved. And he wants folks saved. He wants folks to obey the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. It's something that can be obeyed, the Bible says. He wants us to have faith in it. Because without faith it is impossible to please him, Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He that believes, the Bible says, and is baptized, will be saved. Believes what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And based upon that belief, when you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, when you believe that he came to save you, when you believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection, you're going to ask the same question they did in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37. What can we do about this? I've been living my own way. I've been doing my own thing. But I realize that I'm not the author of morality, that God is the decider of that which is right and wrong. What can I do to fix this? The Lord says we can repent. That means change our mind about how we think and change our lives. Because there's a day coming when that repentance will be brought before Him. When the repentance that was not done will also be brought before Him. Acts chapter 17, 30 and 31. Confess the good name of Jesus before witnesses that you believe that He is the Son of God. That He indeed is equal to God. That you put yourself under Him. Make that good confession with the mouth as Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 tells us to do. And then be immersed in water to have your sins completely washed away. And to be added to the kingdom, the body of Christ. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. You can do that tonight to show that you respect the authority that God has. That you respect the authority of his word and that you are willing to submit to it while we stand and as we sing.